was watching a, a documentary on sailing. Um, I watch a lot of documentaries, and my wife loves that. She's got me watching this show called The Great British Baking Show. Anybody ever seen that before? You can go ahead. Yeah, you, I'm good. She's got me watching this show, and I said, for every time you have to make me watch a show, I'm going to watch a documentary. So I was watching this documentary, and it was all about sailing. And it was about sailing through the 17th and 18th century. And it was talking about the different tactics that the sailors would use in those days to get to where they wanted to get to. And one of the tactics they use is called tacking. And tacking is how a sailing boat or a ship is able to sail directly into a headwind. And I didn't even know that was possible because I believe that in order for a sailing boat or a ship to move forward, it relied upon a wind being behind them and pushing them in a certain direction. How many before tonight you thought that was the only way a ship moved forward to? But there's actually a method where a ship can sail directly into a headwind. And it's, how, it's a certain positioning of the sails. It's a certain maneuvering through the water that allows the ship to move directly towards wind, directly into opposition. How many kind of think you know where I'm going with this? How many believe that God can begin to use you even when it doesn't look like you can move forward? God can move you forward. How many think God can move you and push you right into a headwind? And when it doesn't look like you can make progress, God's saying, no, I can actually move you forward even with a headwind. Praise the Lord. But one of the challenging things about tacking, one of the challenging things about this method of sailing is that because the wind is, is driving towards you, one of the most difficult things is that you lose what's called your frame of reference. In other words, it's difficult for those on the ship to know how fast and even whether or not they're moving forward at all. And I thought this was amazing when I heard it. What happens is the water, the wind's blowing against you and the waves are moving past you. And if you look up, there's probably clouds moving in your direction. And it forms an optical illusion where you think you are moving forward. But what they would find is for hours and hours, they would employ this method. They would be tacking along, thinking that they were moving forward, only to find that they actually hadn't progressed at all. It just looked like they were progressing. How many think that's pretty amazing? Come on, how many are you with me? Say Amen. Praise the Lord. And it would look like they were moving forward even if they weren't moving forward. And I was thinking about that, how that relates so much to the church today and where I believe a lot of believers are at the, tonight. Where it, so often it looks like we're progressing. It looks like the church is moving forward. But if we were actually to stop when the wind dies down, we might find that we were doing a lot of work, that we were staying busy, that we were running around doing all the work of the church and doing all the work of Christianity, but hadn't actually progressed as far as we thought we had progressed. I feel like the enemy's got a lot of people running around busy in the kingdom of God, but they're not actually moving forward in faith and doing great things for Jesus. Can I get some help in here tonight? And so what begins to happen is the enemy begins to progress and move forward and do what he wants to do while the church has the illusion or has the appearance of moving forward but isn't actually doing great things for the kingdom and I think we were reminded of this in 2020 where we've sat, we have all these incredible things in the church today all this technology and all these tools at our disposal but when it came time to actually go through a battle and when it came time to actually go through a fight maybe there are a lot of believers that weren't prepared to exercise the faith that they said they were building up for all those years Maybe there were a lot of churches that got knocked over and didn't know what hit them because for years they were going into a headwind and they thought they were progressing when it just looked like they were progressing. I don't know about you, but I don't want to look like I'm moving forward. I want to move like I'm looking forward. I want to move forward in the kingdom of God. I want the gift of faith to grow in our church. I want the gift of the Holy Spirit to grow in our church. I want to see great and mighty things like never before. I don't just want to have the appearance. I want to have the real thing can we give God some praise for that tonight and for too long the church has been barely getting by there was a move of God called Azusa Street over a hundred years ago now and I feel like sometimes the church tries to capitalize on great events of the past and we're constantly looking backwards but God is saying no I'm, call I'm calling you to look forwards to things that you have never seen before yes the things of the past are great yes the things God's done are amazing but if all you're ever doing is looking backwards you can never progress to the great and mighty things that God has in front of you are you with me tonight? 
tonight. God wants to give you the strength, not just to move forward, but God will actually give you the strength to move forward even with a headwind, even with opposition coming your way, even when it doesn't look like you should be moving forward and it makes no sense to my mind how a ship could sail against the wind. God's saying, I'm going to give you the tools at your disposal. I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to lead you so that even when you shouldn't be, be moving forward, I'm going to progress you. And as believers, church, there's never supposed to be a day that we're standing still there's never supposed to be a day that we're stagnant are you with me today I've discovered that running water is living water come on I discovered that it's puddles and ponds and stagnant water that grow and all nastiness and I don't want any of that but I've discovered also that the enemy has a harder time hitting a moving target and I feel like if the church would just keep on progressing in faith and keep on moving forward in the kingdom, instead of looking backwards, wishing God would do it again and do it again and do it again, if we would progress forwards and say, God, what do you have in store for us? God, set my faith high. Let me to, help me to believe you for great and mighty things that I have never seen before. And if you would set your faith forward, I guarantee on that horizon in life, there are great and mighty things. Your best days are ahead of you. The best days of the church are ahead of you. The best days in the kingdom are still still yet to come in Jesus mighty name and so we got to look forward I love our church because our church has never been about perfection we've always been about progression it's never been about having it perfect today by the way if you get hard on yourself and if you get hard on your family and you get hard on your church because you put a demand on everything to be perfect don't be surprised if you wake up 10 years from now 20 years from now and in your life everything is still the same because if what you want today is perfection, I guarantee you're going to miss that target every single time. You're never going to get perfect. The only place you're ever going to be perfect is heaven. And in fact, the only one that can perfect you is Jesus. So when you put a demand on yourself to be perfect today, what you're actually doing is setting yourself up for failure. And then when you fail, which you will fail, when you fail, then all of a sudden it hits your self-esteem. It hits your confidence. The enemy tells you you're a failure. And what do you do? You don't try again. But if you can make up your mind that I'm not going to try to be perfect today, but I am going to try to be better than I was yesterday, then God can progress you. Come on, are you with me tonight? Come on, even God said, even God said you're not a finished pot, you're clay on the potter's wheel. I've never seen a potter, and I've only ever seen one potter, but if I have, I've, I've never seen a potter put clay on a wheel and then try to move his hands around it really fast. That's what the church is trying to do. They're trying to stay still and say, God, now work me. But the, the clay was always supposed to be spinning. Are you with me? The problem is the church isn't moving. The problem is the church, the believers aren't really doing what they need to do. But when the clay starts moving, God puts his hand on it and he works it and he fashions it into what he wants it to be. And it's about progression, not perfection. It's about becoming, not being. It's about letting God do the work. And he said, if you'll let me do that work and if you'll be patient through the process and you'll let me refine you and work on you, I'm going to turn you into something that is fit for the kingdom of God. I'm going to turn you into something that is perfected. I'm going to turn you into a person that's ready to be in my presence. Because how many know God is preparing you? Not just so that you can have a good day tomorrow. He's not preparing you just so that you can do great things. He's preparing you to be with him in glory. He's preparing you for his presence. Can we give God praise for that? But if you're not willing to go through the process, man, then God can't perfect you. Then God can't work on you. And so he's working you into something that is fit for a great calling. He is working you into something that's fit for a great anointing. He's working you into something that's going to do great things for the kingdom of God. Amen. I remember when I was a kid, my mom had this cabinet in our house. And uh, it was the cabinet that you couldn't get within a 15-foot radius of. I swear I'm not kidding you, church. We all were convinced, and she had us convinced, that if you got anywhere within 20 feet of that thing, the whole thing would shatter to a million pieces. It was full of all these ornate plates, gone with the wind paintings on them. Clark Gable and the other one, I don't know. I remember one time, this is a true story, <laughs> one time, I don't know where my mom was. I think it was just me and my dad home alone, and, and we were eating like chicken wings and pizza. And I grabbed one of those Gone with the Wind plates. I never told her. But I put a chicken wing right on Clark Gable's face and I ate that thing. I was happy to do it. But can I tell you something? 
I know it was like a thousand dollar plate or something, but it was the best chicken wings I ever had, praise the Lord. <laughs> Wash that thing, throw it back in the cabinet, nobody knew the difference. I discovered that there are certain meals that, that you eat on paper plates, and there are certain meals that you eat on fine china. Are you with me tonight? And chicken wings and pizza is a, is a paper plate meal. But how many know you can't eat like a, you can't eat like a, like a, like a 16 ounce or 20 ounce steak on a paper plate? It just doesn't work. And if you went to the nicest restaurant in Tampa, if you went to like Burns Steakhouse and they bring you out this like $300 piece of steak and they serve it on a paper plate, you're going to say this, this plate doesn't line up with the meal that you're serving. Are you with me? Because you expect a fine meal to be served on, 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 on fine china. And then also, if you, if you went to a restaurant and, you, and, you, and they gave you like two chicken wings and a burrito, and then they came out with this gorgeous plate, you'd be like, what's going on? If something doesn't line up. Because how many know you don't serve an extraordinary meal on a paper plate? And God doesn't put an extraordinary calling on someone who's not willing to go through the process. Because I've discovered that the reason fine china is fine china is because fine china goes through a process that a paper plate doesn't go through. In other words, fine china is worked, it's, it's formed, it's, it's put in an oven, it's taken back out of the oven, it's decorated, it's painted, it's made beautiful. It goes through a process so that it can be fit for something great. But a lot of believers wake up on any given Tuesday and say, God, I want to be used by you, but you haven't cracked your Bible open in like three weeks. God, I want an extraordinary calling. I want to be blessed. I want favor. I want increase. I want a platform. I want all of those different things, but you're still a paper plate. So don't expect to get an extraordinary calling, an extraordinary blessing if you're not willing to go through the process. Can we give God praise for that tonight? So there's a process to things in the kingdom of God. And if you want to be fit to do great things for God, you've got to be willing to go through it. The book of Exodus is one of my, my favorite books in the Bible because we see God is working. And how many know when God is working, he's always playing the long game. He's not just figuring it out as he goes. You might be figuring it out as you go, but God's got your life all drawn up. Bible says he's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the, all right, so he already knows what's going to happen. He knows, and, and when he works in your life, he's not just working to make today better. He's not working to make this week better, but he's got the plan of your life all drawn out. And what God loves to do, the Bible says he makes all things work together for your good. He makes good days and he makes bad days work together for your good. He makes mountains and he makes valleys work together for your good. He makes still waters and storms work together for your good. So he takes all the circumstances and possible situations in the world and he brings them into your life and he creates a plan that's going to lead you to great and mighty things. And as long as you obey him and are patient in the process, it's going to end up okay. Can we give God praise for that tonight? And we see God doing that with, with the Israelites throughout the book of Exodus. Now, conventional wisdom, a lot of believers think that the book of Exodus is, is simply a, a, about an exit. They think it's simply about people leaving Egypt. And that's where so often we get confused because the, the book really isn't about people just leaving a bad situation. But the, rather, the, the whole theme of the book of Exodus is, is surrounded by the idea of redemption. And, and, and what you need to understand is God isn't working in your life to get you out of bad situations. He didn't save you to take you from a, a bad person to a good person. He's not working to get you out of trouble. He's not working to help you be happier or help you have a better life. He is working in your life to redeem you, not to rescue you from your bad day. Are you with me? This is where a lot of believers get defeated because we believe that as we press into God, that, that, that God's foremost priority every single day is just to help me have a good day today. No, he's not doing that. What he's doing is he's trying to redeem you. Now, what does the word redeem mean? Redeem actually means to take possession of. And so when God is redeeming you, he's redeeming you because he wants to take back possession of you and bring you back towards himself. Can we give God praise? He is working all things in your life to bring you back into relationship with him, to bring you closer to him. And the number one way that God does that is through communication with you. And in case you believe we serve a distant God, I'm here to tell you, we serve a God who is communicating every single day, every single minute, and every single moment. And the only question you need to worry about is whether or not you're listening. Come on, are you with me tonight? 
Believers who walk around saying, I just need God to speak to me. I'm just waiting on a word, waiting on a word, waiting on a word. I want to tell you something. You can hear the word of God. You can hear the voice of God any time that you want to hear. If you want to hear the voice of God tonight, all you got to do is open your Bible and read it out loud. And you will hear the voice of God right there in your home. Why? Because God is always speaking to those who are listening. The Bible says, my sheep know my voice, which means God has something he wants to tell you. And the thing that God loves to talk about, can anybody guess what it is? The number one thing God loves to talk about is himself. The Bible says we serve a jealous God. If you take the conversation, you put it on yourself too much, he's going to say, no, 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 let's get back to me. Are you with me tonight? God loves to talk about himself. Why? Because it's in talking about himself that he reveals himself. God doesn't communicate with you for any other reason but to give you a greater revelation of who he is. Because if you, have, if you see God revealed, if when in God communicating to you, he reveals himself to you, I promise you, you are going to fall more and more in love with him. I promise you, you're going to run after him like never before. There's never any, been a person in this entire world who has had God revealed to them who didn't fall in love with him. Come on, are you with me tonight? Whenever I see a believer that says, oh, I just feel dried out or I feel like I'm not where I need to be in God, I know exactly what your problem is. You're not communicating with the Father, and because you're not communicating with the Father, he's not communicating to you. Are you with me tonight? If you're not in communication with the Father, you're never ever going to love the Father because relationships are, are, are absolutely rely upon communication. When I met my wife and we went on our first date, we went to Starbucks. I didn't sit down at Starbucks with her and tell her everything that I wanted her to be. But I let her communicate to me who she was. Are y'all following me tonight? If I, I, I didn't sit down and, and define to her who she was or what I expected her to be or what I wanted to be, I let her sit down and tell me and tell me the definition of who Brittany Billsborough was. Brittany Longabardi at the time. And I fell in love with the definition. I think the purest form of love is that you allow someone to self-define. You allow them to tell you who they are and you fall in love with that definition. I don't know. I, I couldn't create a version of my wife better than the one she is. Are you with me? But so often we sit down and we go to pray or we go to talk to God or we go into our word and we look for what we want to hear. We look for what we want to see and we try to tell God who he is rather than let him tell us who he is and fall in love with who he is. Can I tell you something? God, the reality of God is that he's not always going to say things that make you happy. He's not always going to give you exactly what you want. But when you love him and when you pursue him with your whole life and you let him tell you who he is, I promise you, you will fall in love with who he is because God is always better. The, the reality of God is always going to be better than your version of God. Come on, can we give God praise for that? And so whenever I see a believer who's like, man, I, 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 I'm just, I, I'm looking for something in God and saying, I'm looking for God to be something that he doesn't seem to be to me. You know, you're trying to tell God who he is and you need to fall in love with the truth of God. You need to get into his word. You need to be on your knees. You need to worship him and praise him and give everything over to him. Can we give God praise for that? And so relationship is only possible through communication and we need to learn to speak to God. And so God begins the story throughout the book of Genesis, throughout the book of Exodus. God has a method of communicating to man. God communicates to man throughout Genesis and from creation to this point with Moses. He communicates to man on a one-to-one -one basis. He looks out on the world and he sees certain people and he communicates directly to them. Y'all following me on this? I know you're thinking about hot dogs, but I want you to stick with me. He communicates directly to them. He sees Abraham. He sees Noah. And he sees what he wants to have done on the earth. And he uses these men to see it happen. In other words, he doesn't speak to large groups of people. He doesn't speak to, to large nations at one time. But he speaks directly to people. And he uses that one person to see his will be done. All that begins to change here in the book of Exodus when God says, I'm about to speak to this people en masse. I'm about to show myself off, not just to one person, not just to reveal myself to one person, but I'm about to reveal myself to an entire people. 
This is a powerful moment in the scripture. And how God does this is he speaks first to Moses. He looks for a man. And he chooses to use this man, Moses, and he gives him a revelation about who he is in the burning bush. And I want to tell you something. God is still the God that you need to get alone with him and speak directly to him. Come on, how many know we gather in church like this on a Sunday morning? And it's a great thing because you can get revelation of who God is in church on a Sunday morning. You can get revelation of who God is in worship and in times of corporate gathering. But ultimately, who you are in Jesus is going to be determined by whether or not you get in your own place with God. Whether or not you find yourself locked in your little prayer closet. Whether or not you can call on his name when nobody's watching you. when When it's not easy, when everybody else is there. If you can call on your God in the midnight hour. If you can call on your God anywhere and everywhere. That's how you know you got something special in Jesus. Come on, are you with? me so God wants to see a church that knows how to knows how to get alone with him and he he gets alone with with Moses and he speaks to him and he gives him instructions for what he wants him to do and Moses asks God he says who should I tell the people what should I tell them that your name is so what you might not realize is that prior to this moment in the scripture that that God actually really hadn't given himself a name for what people should call him prior to this moment uh, there was no specific name for God. In fact, what they would have called him was just, was just a, a generic term like El. But at this moment in Scripture, when Moses says, what should I tell them? Whose name should I tell them? He says, tell them I am that I am. And that would be the name of God. That would be the word, what we call him, Yahweh, God. And, and, and he, he gives them this name because he's going to take this name. And now God is about to reveal himself en masse to this people, to the Israelites. And the way God does that is is through many different means. And we know the story. Moses shows up in Egypt, and and, and God works through the ten plagues. How many know the clearest message ever sent in all of human history was the ten plagues? I mean, if you were Pharaoh, I would have gotten it after the first plague. I mean, if it takes ten, some of you, you, God's trying so hard to speak to you, it might take ten plagues for him to get a word in. But God has to send ten plagues to get a message to this man named Pharaoh. And even still, the Israelites did not have the faith that they needed. But even still, God says, uh, God leads them out of Egypt. And this is what I want to focus on in the message tonight. God leads them out of Egypt and leads them towards the place that he wanted them to get to. How many have a place in this room, a vision, a dream, a goal, a place in God, a place in life, in your business, in your family that you want to get to? I promise you, if you don't have a place, you're not going to get very far. You should have something out before you right now. You should have a faith dream. You should have a faith goal. You should have something you want to be or something you want to become. Because if you don't have a destination, a goal in mind, you're never going to get anywhere at all. Come on, can I get some help in here tonight? Some of you are like, shoot, I should have come up with a goal. But it's true. You're just going to get stagnant. You're just going to get stale. But God speaks, and he says, I'm taking you to a place. I have a destination in mind. But what you need to understand is that when God speaks, when God says he wants to get you somewhere, very rarely does he ever tell you when he wants you to get there. Very rarely does he ever tell you how he wants you to get there. Sometimes he just says, get up and start walking. How many remember what he said to Abraham? He said, get up and go to a place that I will show you. I'm not going to tell you when I'm going to show you. I'm not going to tell you where it's going to be. But I want you to gather everything in your life up together, and I just want you to start walking. How many have the faith that you think, man, if God told me to get up and start walking, I would start walking right now? Come on. And so God speaks, and he says, I want you to, I want you to go out, and I'm going to send you to a place called the promised land and and Pharaoh agrees to to let the Israelites go and and at the beginning of this moment in the story it it sounds like a win but but still God isn't finished because God's goal was not to get the Israelites out of Egypt and his goal was not to get the Israelites to the promised land are you following me tonight and God's goal is not to get you out of debt and God's goal is not to fix your broken marriage And God's goal is not to fix your business. And God's goal is not to to do any of the things. His number one goal is not to do any of those things. But rather, God's goal is to redeem you to himself. Come on, y'all aren't getting it tonight. God's foremost priority 
His foremost priority is that he receive all glory, all honor, and all praise. And I preach this, I preach this church all the time. When God looks out on the universe, he sees nothing greater than himself. When I look out on the world, I might find better singers than me. I might find better guitar players than me. I could certainly find better keyboard players than me. But I'm, I, when God looks out on the universe, he cannot find anything that is greater than himself. And so he is consumed with receiving all glory and all power and all praise and you better believe he will do just about anything to, to get it and so God makes it very clear here in the scripture that he is going to allow in fact he makes it clear in Exodus 14 that he intends to destroy the armies of Pharaoh so that he would receive all glory and honor like from the before it ever happened, before Moses ever arrived at the Red Sea, God already had it in his mind that he was going to destroy this army even after Pharaoh had already let them go. Come on, I want you to think about that for a second. Pharaoh had already released the Israelites to go towards the promised land. But the Bible says that God turned Pharaoh's heart to the point where he said, no, I have to go and pursue them. Why? Because God intended and wanted to destroy the armies of Egypt so that, for no other reason, but so that he could receive all glory, honor, and praise. God is utterly consumed with himself and he has every single right to be. There is no one like him. And so he uses this circumstance. He uses this situation. He is willing to level this entire army that had no intention of going out there after the Israelites. He is willing to destroy them, perfectly willing to do that so that he would receive the glory, honor, and praise. If God is willing to go to that length to receive praise and to receive the glory, how far do you think he's willing to go in your life? Thank God Jesus stands in our defense and shelters us from some of those things because I'll tell you something. There is nothing that God wouldn't do to receive glory, honor, and praise because how many know he deserves all of it? Come on, I said he deserves all of it. Come on, why don't you start right now? Give him a little bit of praise. And so he puts this plan in mind. He, he, he's going to destroy the armies of Egypt so that the Israelites would, would worship him and praise him and give him at least some of the glory that he deserves. Not only does he do that, but rather he actually, did you know that, 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 that the Red Sea is not even on the way to the promised land? Come on, are you with me tonight? The Red Sea is not even on the path to the promised land. In fact, Moses and the Israelites were already on the way towards Canaan. To, they were already going the right direction when God says, no, I'm going to reroute you. I'm going to put you in the path of the Egyptian army. Not only that, but I'm going to put an impossible circumstance out in front of you. And I'm going to put you in this situation. Now, why is God doing that? Some of you, if you saw exactly where you wanted to be, if you saw exactly what you were dreaming of right there, right in front of you, only a few steps away, and God said no I'm going to route you down this other path I'm going to take you a different way how many have the faith to believe that you would trust God and refuse to go towards the thing that you wanted come on are you with me tonight that's exactly what God did he said, I, I know that Canaan is right there. I know that everything that I told you was coming is right there. But I'm going to put you on a different path. Why? Because God is not trying to get you to a promised land. He's not trying to get you to the thing that you're believing for. His foremost priority is to make a praiser and a worshiper out of you tonight. Amen. And so God works this stage. He works this moment. He, he, he sets up this, this moment in time that, that he is going to show off, that he is going to put his greatness and his power on display. And I want you to know we serve a God that never changes. Amen? And if he's a God that never changes, that if he wanted to put his glory and power on display back then, then I believe we serve a God who desires to put his glory and power on display today. Come on, y'all aren't helping me tonight. I feel like so often we, 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 God is so limited, in, and even though he's unlimited, but, he, but he, he will not surpass our will. And there's so much that God wants to do. And there's so many miracles he wants to do. And there's so many great things that he wants to do. And he says, if you saw my power on display even for a single moment, if this world saw the greatness of our God even for a single moment, how many know every knee would bow and every tongue would confess? So we serve a God tonight who wants to put his greatness on display and he responds tonight to our faith. He responds to our obedience. He responds when we put him first. Are you with me tonight? 
And so he sets up this moment. He sets up the stage to where he is going to perform, where he is going to do an incredible thing, where he is going to show off and show off his power. And he puts Moses and the Israelites right in front of the Red Sea. And he puts the Egyptian army behind them. And I don't need to tell you the story. You know the story tonight. But he puts an impossible circumstance in front of them and an impossible situation behind them. I want you to know how many would still trust God in that moment. I've discovered that sometimes for a lot of believers, it's only when we hit the moment where we have no other options that we choose to praise God. It's like it's only once you hit the bottom of the barrel that you call out the name of Jesus. Come on, it's only when things can't get any worse that you say, I guess I'll try God now. And I want to encourage you to make Jesus the first place that you run in 2021. I want to encourage you to say, man, the moment you find yourself in a situation and you don't know what to do and you don't know what to say and you don't know what God's going to do, I want to encourage you to say, right now in this moment, I'm not going to try to solve it by myself. I'm not going to try to fix it by myself. I'm not going to run around. I'm not going to I'm not going to Google search. I'm not going to do anything. But right now in this moment, I'm going to mention first the name of Jesus. I'm going to call upon his name because no other thing in this world for me can make a way the way the name of Jesus can make away no other name is power more powerful than the mighty name of Jesus you don't think God sees it when you turn to something else before him come on you don't think God sees it when you when you when you run to the things of this world trying to look for an answer when God's saying I'm right here and I am the answer maybe that's why he called himself I am because everything you need him to be he's saying I am Come on, every answer that you need out in this world, I am. Every situation that you have, I am the answer. He said, I am the way. He said, I am the truth. He said, I am the way. I am the hope. I am the life. I am the vine. I am the door. I am the way where there seems to be no other way. I am the wheel at the center of the wheel. And no matter what you're going through in this entire life, and in this entire world, no matter what you go through, you better believe I am the answer. Now, if he's saying, I am, you need to start saying it back. You need to start saying, he is. Come on, I said, he is. You need to start believing that every single day. Because God is screaming from heaven, I am the way. And the church is looking every other direction. No wonder 2020 happened the way 2020 happened. Come on, are you with me tonight? So God is calling out to his people. And he called out here in this moment. But this is how God communicated through to the Israelites. He didn't communicate back then. There, He didn't communicate through uh, one-to-one revelation to the Israelites. There were too many of them. But God communicated through mighty acts of his power. And if you think there's something, I, I don't know, even as a young, a lot of young preachers my age, they don't, they don't talk about miracles, church. They don't talk about Jesus returning. Come on, are you with me tonight? They don't talk about signs and wonders. They ixnay them from the Bible. And they preach on Jesus and the works that he did, but they don't talk as if God could still do it. Come on, are you with me today? It's a certain level of faith to believe Jesus did and God did. It's a different level of faith to believe God is and God can. I'm serious, church. And this is why the preachers of my generation, they don't actually believe God is and God can. If you ask them to lay hands on somebody, they probably fall out. I'm, I'm not kidding. Oh, they, 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 they preach like Pentecostals. They talk about the Spirit of God. They talk about the gifts, but you never see them in operation. They talk about the move of God, but you never see them have one. They talk about prophesying. They talk about tongues, but you never see them operate in it. Come on, that's just nothing but, that's just nothing but an old washed up thing. That's just nothing but talking about what happened before. But it's a church that's not looking forward. It's a church that's not moving forward. It's just like that ship sailing into the headwind. And everything around it looks like it's moving, but it's not actually getting anywhere. Why? Because what moves the church forward has always been a move of the Spirit of God. What progresses the church forward has always been the Spirit of God working in and amongst people. It's the Spirit of God we need in our churches. It's the Spirit of God we need in our pulpits. It's the Spirit of God we need in our pews. It's the Spirit of God we need to move and wreck this nation and wreck the church one more time. Because that is what moves us forward. Come on, I said that's what moves us forward. But God communicates here and he's communicating to the Israelites And he is communicating through great acts of power. This is why I wanted to say this. God never changes. And if there's one thing that's going to touch the world, it's there's one thing that's going to help us to see a great and incredible last day's revival. It's when God is able to show himself off. Come on, are you with me tonight? 
God always, always, always will respond to faith. He will always respond to faith. Now, to the Israelites, God had to show great acts and mighty acts of power so that we would have faith. But how many know as believers, as the church, we are already supposed to be redeemed in Christ? Are you with me? Meaning we are supposed to have faith so that we can see great and mighty acts of God. So that we can see God touch this land. So we can see God do great things. And if we're not seeing God do certain things, if we're not seeing the miracles that God talks about, if we're not seeing signs and wonders, if we're not seeing those things, I know in this church, we see incredible things but I believe there is even more that God wants to do I believe God wants to show himself at church I believe great life church is like an empty canvas and God is saying man I want to paint a picture I want to do something incredible I want to put my greatness on display through this church through this people through this place like never before I want them to see things that the world can't explain away I want them to see things that's even baffled their minds I want to see great and mighty things so God's saying God's about to show off to the Israelites. He's about to reveal himself to their, reveal his power. He's about to reveal his greatness. Why? Because he is working to bring them unto himself. He makes it clear that in this moment, this would be a moment that would leave them touched and changed forever. There's a reason the Jews, there's a reason uh, in Israel, there's a reason they still talk about and celebrate this moment today. Are you with me tonight? There's a reason this story in Exodus is so much more than a story. And it's some of the most powerful imagery in all the Bible. It's some of the most powerful moments in all of the Bible. Why? Because this is, a, this is, this is like God's beautiful opera. It's like God's beautiful moment where he's about to show himself off like never before. Up to this point, revelation of God happened on a one-to-one basis. You still need that one-to-one revelation of God. If God's communicating to you, you're living in revelation. One of the clearest evidences, too, that you know God is speaking and working in your life and that you know God is communicating to you is when you see the ordinary, everyday things of this world and you see God in them. People who just coast through life and they don't see the beauty of life, they don't see the beauty of this world, they don't have a revelation of the Father. People who live in a revelation of the Father will look at the ordinary, We'll look at the everyday, things that the world rolls past, and they will see the beauty in it. People who have a revelation of God see people as children of God and not people in their way. Are you with me? People who don't have a revelation of God view people as a problem. I said they view people as a problem. That's what happens a lot right now in our, I don't mean to get political, but in our government, in our world, and they view people as a problem. But people that are caught up in the revelation of the Father, they view people as children of God, and so you are able to love other people. And I'm telling you, church, I meet believers all the time that every time they talk about people, their instinct is to talk negatively. Their instinct is to talk down. And I want to tell you, you're out of touch with the Father. Jesus would not even talk to you. Are you with me tonight? Jesus hung out with people that people didn't like to talk good about. And so you know you have a revelation of the Father when you begin to look at the ordinary, everyday things and God is speaking. And so God is speaking through creation. God is speaking through His Word. God is speaking through, uh, God is speaking through His Holy Spirit. God is speaking to everyone. God is speaking to those who are listening tonight. And so the Israelites are in this moment. And of course, we know God gives them the command because God is about to communicate himself here in this moment. And he says, Moses, I want you to stretch out your staff towards the sea. And you know the story. You know what happened. Moses leads the Israelites through the Red Sea. The waters cave in and come in around him. And they celebrate and they praise God on the other side. Now, I know you're probably thinking, Pastor Brian, they got into a lot of trouble after that. Absolutely, they did. Are you with me? And even believers who see God do great and mighty things in their life will go through trouble again. And you'll have days where you doubt and you have days where you wonder. And you'll have days where you call out to God and you say, God, did you even hear me? Or God, are you even there? But I'm going to tell you something. If you will just keep on pressing into Jesus like never before. If you will just keep on letting your faith rise and stay hungry. You're going to see God do great and mighty things in your life. God desires and wants to communicate to you and reveal himself to you. 
And I get a little bit frustrated, church, when I see so many believers, especially men, who fill church seats every Sunday and fill pews. But when you, if you ask them to put two consecutive sentences together about who God is and why they love them, they would stutter if they even tried. They would barely be able to get there. And if you love the Father tonight, you should be able to talk for days about who he is and why he is and why you serve him and why you love him. You should be able to go on and on and on. And when you run out of words, then the tongues can begin to flow out of you. And you can just begin to worship and praise God. Why? Because we need to have a revelation of the Father. And a revelation of the Father means God is communicating himself to you. I'm closing with this. So God is, is playing the long game. I told you at the beginning of the message, God is playing the long game in your life. So if you don't see what you want to see tomorrow, and you turn back and you, and you, and you give up and you stop praying about it, you stop talking to God about it, then, then, man, you were probably never, ever going to get there anyway. See, what happens here is there's a moment. There's a moment, moments in life that I call the, the they're called like inflection points in life. And an inflection point is, in mathematics, it's a moment on a curve where it's, it's called the apex of the curve. Does anybody like to drive their car really fast? I love driving my car really fast. I don't do it with my kids in it, but I, I do it when I'm on my own. Praise the Lord. Something so special. I just, it's amazing. But I got this windy road near my house that goes up to my house, and it's, it's, it's this beautiful road, and I love to just break the speed limit. And when you're going around a curve in racing or in, in, when you're driving a car, there's something called the apex of the curve. And the apex of the curve is the inflection point. It's, it's how you maintain the straightest line possible through the curve, and you shave like tenths of a second off in a race. And, and I like to pretend I'm Mario Andretti when I'm doing it. And, and so I progress, there's that inflection point. And these are the inflection point. The inflection point is, is the moment in a curve where you go from going in one direction to the other. And these are the moments in life that, that kind of define you. These are the moments in life that kind of take you from one place to another place. They take you from one faith to another faith. They take you from one glory to another glory. My problem with, is so often God wants to set us up for these moments, but we miss them. And here's why we miss them. Because way back when Moses was on his way to Canaan, and God said, I wanted you to go towards the Red Sea. That's so often where so many believers and so many people in the church would say, no, I'm going to carry on. So what you miss is the opportunity. You, you miss the opportunity for a bad day. Because, I mean, you know, Egypt behind you and, and the Red Sea in front of you, that's a lot of stress right there. That's a lot of pressure right there. But how many know the pressure was always meant, you, as believers, we were always meant to be in those kind of situations because those are the moments where God wants to show himself off to you. And so the way believers miss it so often is way back when we can see Canaan and we can see the place that we want to get to. And God says, no, I want to put you in this place that doesn't look as good and it's going to probably be a tough time. And it's going to probably be, that's where I want you. Those are the moments where we turn back. Those are the moments where we doubt. Those are the moments where we carry on with our own desires. But I'm telling you, church, if you will trust God, if you will believe that he's got the best thing for you, if you will believe that he's got a plan in it all, if you will trust him through the process, he's going to put you in a moment where it looks like all oh, hope is lost. He's going to put you in a moment where it looks like there's no other way. But out of that circumstance, you're going to come out with a story. You're going to come out with a testimony. You're going to come out with a miracle. You're going to come out with something that you didn't have have before you're gonna have your own Red Sea moment you're gonna have a story of when it didn't look like it was possible and it didn't look like God could do it and we had the army behind us and a sea in front of us but somehow God made a way and he will always 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 make a way he will always reveal himself he will always do a great and mighty thing for you and through you God wants to reveal himself to you tonight come on give the Lord a great and mighty praise Praise the Lord. Be seated for one more second. Be seated for one more second. And so, these are the moments. I call this message, I can't stay here. I can't stay here because it's these inflection points in life that God wants to bring you to and that God wants to bring you the church through and to. And I'm telling you, church, 2020 was an inflection point for the body of Christ. 2020 was the point where it said, I, I can either, I can either die here or I can progress here. I can either let my faith rise and see God do his greatest work yet or I can die right here in this valley in front of the Red Sea. How many church, how many know the church isn't going anywhere? Can I remind you anytime you think the worst days are ahead, can I remind you that in the kingdom of God that Jesus is the king of this kingdom 
And if Jesus isn't going anywhere, then the church isn't going anywhere. But the best is still yet to come. And so there's going to be that moment where you're standing in front of an impossible situation. And it's not about knowing what God is going to do next. It's not about knowing what's going to happen next. It's about trusting God that something is going to happen next. Are you following me tonight? I'm closing with this. And I think about if I could go back in time and if I could talk to so many of the great men of the Bible. And if I could ask them one question, I'd probably say, either where are you going or what are you doing? And if I would ask them that, I think for most of them, their answer would probably be the exact same. Because I feel like if you went up and asked Moses when, or asked Noah when he cut down the first tree to build an ark, and I said, Noah, what are you doing? He'd probably say, I don't know. Because I don't even know what an ark is. Are you with me tonight? And if I asked Abraham when he was stargazing, and when he was telling his whole family and all of his possessions, and if I asked him Moses, or I asked him Abraham, where are you going? He'd probably say, I don't know. Man, half the church freaks out when they don't know. And they start running around looking for an answer. Can I tell you something? Your answer, by the way, is not going to be found in some prophecy you saw on Facebook. You might as well read a horoscope. 99% of that stuff is garbage, and it's not the voice of God. Can I tell you something? I'm so tired of the church looking for an answer when we have a whole book of answers right there. You might as well consult a horoscope. If you're going to start sharing around, looking for, looking, for, looking for your hope for tomorrow in some prophecy that you found shared on Instagram or shared on Facebook. I got all the answers I need. If God never gives me a prophetic word for the rest of my life, I have everything I need to serve him with diligence and perseverance for the rest of my life. Stop looking for answers from man. Stop looking for answers from a government. Stop believing that your savior is a certain president or a certain man. He's not. God by the way, if your whole life got messed up because of the 2020 election and you were so obsessed with trust the plan, trust the plan, trust the plan, the only plan I've ever trusted is the plan laid out in the word of God. The only plan I've ever trusted is the one that Jesus laid out before me. When he said, I've got plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope in your future. So if I, if I talked to Moses right after he was walking in front of a burning bush and I said, Moses, what are you doing? I don't know. Where are you going? I don't know. If I talked to Paul right after he got blinded on the road to Damascus and I said, Paul, what are you doing? Where are you going? He'd say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because I want to tell you what real faith looks like. Real faith looks like I don't know where I'm going and I don't know what God is doing and I don't know where this path is taking me and I don't know what God has in store. I don't know where I'm going but I know that I can't stay here I know that God spoke to me I know that God said go I know that God said get up I know that God said keep moving I know he said trust me I know he said I'm gonna take care of you so I'm just gonna get up and start walking and I don't know what tomorrow holds but I know who holds tomorrow come on can you give the Lord a great and mighty praise in this house tonight come on give him a great and mighty praise in this house tonight.